Okay, folks, recorder's going, so uh, let's go ahead and get started today, um, and I'll turn the screens on here. Uh, so the first thing I want to go over before we get into the lecture content, actually just a couple things. First, um, uh, you might be wondering sort of how the attendance thing is going since we introduced the attendance word that I'm probably going to forget at the end, and then someone will yell, attendance word, okay. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely having its intended effects right seeing fuller rooms that's good um now you might be wondering what is the consequence uh other than what it says in the syllabus which you know what it says in the syllabus is quite dire uh you know in terms of you know you have this many excused or unexcused rather absences and then you can just be you know tossed uh, you know i would rather you know rather like to not have to think about that uh but the more practical uh, consequence is there will be a participation grade uh, that will add. It'll be, you know, a 100 point grade like a major assignment. Most of you will just get those points, right? It'll, you'll just get them. It'll just be like a, a gift to you. And, and incidentally, because we didn't start the attendance system until like basically midway through the class, uh, you know, you don't have amnesty for those absences, right? I mean, we don't have a record of that, so it's I'm not going to go back and guess, right? Um, so what we'll do is we will look at the end of the uh, semester and, and kind of see, you know, who's been attending most of the time uh, or whatever. And again, most of you are going to get all those points. It'll only start to go down if we look and go, wow. There's a lot of, you know, uh, non, you know, you haven't been giving us the attendance word very much, right? Now, when uh, those of you had, who have emailed me with various things that have come up, uh, like you're sick, uh, maybe there's like a COVID quarantine thing or uh, some other, you know, reasonable circumstance, what I typically do is I'll just tell you what it is so you can put it in the assignment, okay? Like, um, and so that's kind of how we're handling those things. So I expect to look at those and see, okay, cool. Uh, you know, regardless of whether it was excused or not, you've gotten, you know, the word either because you were here or because you gave me like, you know, a, a good reason. And, and it's not like the 10th time. I, I mean, there is that too. It's like, no one fortunately has done this yet. But like, if you're like, you know, you have 10, you know, in a row, just like things that come up, that's, you know, obviously we're going to stop uh, just assuming that you're, you know, being truthful and all that or, or you know, legit. Uh, so just letting you know how that how that's going to work, okay? And again, this is all in the context of this is the beta test of the class, so this is all we're learning kind of what we have to do to manage it. Okay, um, that's that part out of the way. The next thing I wanted to talk about, um, because it does actually have to do with our uh, lecture today a little bit, and I just think it's interesting, is in my uh, CGT 345 class, that's my level design class, which I would say is maybe like my flagship class here. It's sort of the one that's d most directly based on my own knowledge and experience more than any other class I teach, although th they're all like that. Um, that one is sort of really my, my where I'm most at home. Uh, I'm doing some research here, and it's kind of interesting because it's, um, you know, research is something I've been dragged into at Purdue kicking and screaming because I'm a clinical I'm a clinical guy, right? Supposed to be teaching most of the time, and I do, right? Uh, but they still love you to do research anyway because it's, you know, it's Purdue. Uh, and I've actually been enjoying it much more than I thought I would, honestly. And what I'm researching is fun in student projects in particular because um, what I've noticed is that student projects can be like really well made, but they're not necessarily always fun, right? So I'm trying to, and then, but they get a good grade anyway because we try to grade on objective criteria. So I noticed this kind of divergence between good execution and fun that sometimes occur. And I'm trying to learn, well, the projects that are fun, what makes them fun? So I can, you know, A, just get good game design insights. So there's kind of a game design research angle to it. And then there's an educational ang angle to it where I can start to share those things with you all so that you can, you know, make better stuff. And, you know, we all want to make better stuff. Now, philosophically, you might say um, the games even have to be fun. Is that even a requirement? And that's a big philosophical thing, uh, kind of uh, so something that, you know, uh, in academia we might discuss. But uh, I'm at least for my research, going to go ahead and proceed with the assumption that fun is, you know, a desirable outcome. 
uh, as nebulous as fun can be. Um, so what are some of the things I'm observing? Because I just got the data back. That's why I'm kind of excited and fully caffeinated about it, uh, is I was just looking at the data sets today, uh, and I'm already seeing some cool observations I wanted to pass on to you because, hey, you're making stuff in 245. You're going to keep making stuff next semester. So the one thing that's, I think, really simple but, like, really good news for you all is that uh, on a broad scale – Simply making systems that work, like, just seems to provoke good responses from everyone. They What they're doing is they, they play each other's projects. Now, they know that the person that they're testing, they're never going to see those comments. So they know who, you know, they know who it is. They know it's their neighbor's project, but they're writing comments that they'll never see. Only I see them for research purposes, just to let you know sort of the methodology and it's basically a series of essay questions about how much fun they had and things that are trying to get at the attributes of the games or whatever but just making things that function well like you know this goes back to my comment earlier in the class about like hey we're kind of hardwired as human beings to like systems you know to put inputs into things and get outputs and that's definitely uh being confirmed i think by some of this data now one thing i'll i'll comment on is that I do think that uh, there is an interesting bias here. These are students at Purdue, uh, and they're very positive. I mean, I was actually surprised by how positive these comments were. I was expecting a lot more flame throwing, honestly, because they know that you know the their their friend or colleague is not going to see these things, right? I'm just going to see them, uh, and the uh, grad student I have helping me uh, code this data uh, will see it, but that's it. Um, and so I do think there's a little bit of a bias there. We all know that on the internet, people are a lot more hardcore on their uh, sort of critique, right? And you'll even see that, those of you that are doing the bonus assignment, looking at uh, some of the games that Purdue students have published on Steam or whatever. Uh, yeah, on Steam, when it's totally anonymous and they, you don't know who it is at all, you've never met the person before, people are a lot harsher. So I am kind of filtering this data from, you know, that perspective as well, right? That people are being maybe a lot more positive than it'd be if they went and spent $60 on a game or something. Uh, but that's one observation. Just when you make something that works well, people kind of have this default amount of fun. The other thing I notice is in, in the data set so far uh, is something that we're going to talk about in a minute here with Jesse Shell. Whenever uh, the author of the game project uh, surprised the player in some way, that always got the strongest response. So it's sort of like, okay, if you made something that worked well, and another component that I'm seeing is if people knew what the heck to do, that's another huge thing, is the player know what to do. It's easy to take that for granted, right, in games. So those two things, working well, knowing what to do, that almost always led to an overall positive response. But the ones where the responses were effusive in their praise it was when uh, they were surprised. And we're going to talk about in a little bit in this lecture that this is actually how uh, Jesse Shell defines fun, is pleasure with surprise. And it's kind of cool to see that actually play out in real data that I'm collecting. So just thought I'd let you know uh, kind of what I'm doing on the research side of things because I think it's uh, really interesting. Okay, uh, let's proceed then uh, with the content today. Okay, so we are talking about uh, the, uh, we're going back to, rather, uh, Jesse Shell's Art of Game Design and Public Lenses. We talked about it a little bit, I believe, earlier this semester uh, with documentation. Uh, it's, we're in week 10, so I'm st my memory is starting to fade a little bit uh, about you know, what order we've tackled these things in. So uh, this is basically the uh, first parts of the book here is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so who is... Jesse Shell, why should we care about him? So uh, he's a game designer and visionary, CEO of Shell Games, and a faculty member of Carnegie Mellon, which is like a big time, big time school. Uh, some of you may go there uh, for graduate studies if you don't, uh, you know, stay here. Uh, I often am, you know, it's whenever someone approaches me for a letter, uh, grad school recommendation letter, Carnegie Mellon comes up a lot. Uh, so he is sort of similar to Nolan Bushnell a little bit in that I think he's got this great background that makes him kind of well positioned to do what he does uh, because he's a software engineer 
uh, Disney Imagineer, right? That's someone that worked in the theme park world and a circus juggler, right? So this is kind of a similar background here. Someone that understands technology and understands entertainment, right? In a very particular way. Um, and uh, his career, uh, he's worked on things like Toontown Online, uh, Orion Trail, which is, I believe, what's pictured there, and a VR game called I Expect You to Die. Um, but even more than his game output, what makes Jesse Shell kind of interesting is uh, when we talked about um, uh, the previous author that we were talking about, uh, uh, Chris Crawford, you know, he had this, he was famous, I think, primarily as a game creator. I think Jesse Shell is probably at least as famous as being a, a popular video game design academic, right? Even though, yes, he's made plenty of games. Uh, he's very well known on the kind of public speaking circuit, conference circuit. He's a very captivating speaker. Uh, all of us that give lectures to students and, and do the things I do, we all kind of look at him as the, you know, he's the daddy, right? He's like the best, one of the best speakers out there that talks about game design. Very good speaker, very polished. Okay, so his book, uh, and there he is giving one of those polished speeches, I'm sure, uh, originally written in 2008, but it just keeps getting updated. In fact, it got a very recent update, uh, you know, even I think last summer. Uh, and it is a large sprawling tome, covers a lot of things. Uh, and really it does reflect, I think, the person because he's kind of an energetic, uh, always on, you know, sort of guy. And that's kind of how his book is. Lots of energy, a very charismatic now, one of the critiques I always like to mention, uh, you know, with these famous works, just like I did with uh, Chris Crawford's The Art of Computer Game Design. It's kind of funny that they have a very similar title. Um, I do like to mention some critiques, right? Uh, and the critique of Shell's book is that it, it might cover some topics in a superficial way because he is covering so much in there. So uh, that would be a common critique. Now, the big idea that he frames his entire book with is this notion of lenses, okay? And the reason he does this is he says, look, uh, I, because game design kind of very uncomfortably sits between sort of the chasm between an art and a science, uh, there's probably never going to be a grand unifying game design theory as much as we try, like just a, you know, a, a this is how you make game sort of thing. And so in order to solve this, well, how do you then engage this discipline in any kind of intellectual rigor? His solution is to have lenses then, right? If we don't have one way to make a game, that's just, this is just how you do it, right? Uh, instead, we have different lenses that we apply to different situations, right? Not all games are going to use all different types of lenses. Different perspectives might be a word, uh, another word choice that you may prefer, um, and so that's why it's called The Art of Computer Game Design or Game Design, A Book of Lenses. And in the book, at least in the edition I have in my office, there's 112 lenses. He's probably adding them as, uh, you know, as they make more editions. So we're not going to consider all of these lenses in this class. That would be a little, little bit of overscope. And, of course, you have the book because it's one of the required texts. So uh, you can investigate uh, the, you know, 100 lenses that we won't talk about or whatever it is. Okay, so the book starts out by this discussion of the designer creates an experience. And this is another kind of framing mechanism that he uses throughout the book. It's always the blah does the blah, right? That's kind of how he frames all the topics, which is kind of a nice way of organizing the material. Um, and so he begins the book by offering this notion that uh, a game designer – is at the end of the day creating an experience. Uh, and a game is just the vehicle by which that experience happens. And I like this because, at least to me, it kind of opens the door for a lot of alternative things, right? We don't get bogged down with, well, this isn't a game because it doesn't have like XYZ attribute, right? And this is one of the differences between, I think, Jesse Shell's thoughts and uh, Chris Crawford's thoughts. Whereas I think Crawford has like some pretty, you know, well-defined ideas of what a game is. And if you don't do those things, he's like, not a game, right? Remember, you don't do a, you don't imitate sports. You don't, uh, you know, you don't copy, you know, puzzles are not games, all these things. 
Shell has, I think, a little bit more, it's a fuzzier, more amorphous definition of what a game is, but it allows for more. It's more of a gestalt-based idea, right? Uh, and I like that because, look, I mean, uh, I play lots of games that are, you know, sort of, everyone would consider them a game, right? You have systems, you, give, you, get, you put in inputs, you get outputs or whatever, but what about something like, um, you know, visual novel type experiences like, uh, like Phoenix Wright would be the ones I'm familiar with, right? I had a tremendous positive experience playing those games, and those games have pretty limited amounts of interactivity, right? They would be undoubtedly, especially because he's so interested in kind of procedural narrative, Chris Crawford would definitely critique those games as not being real games because of how limited the interactivity is. I think what Shell is saying is, hey, that doesn't matter because you're having this great experience, yes. Yeah, and I think what you're observing with how he and his team designed uh, I Expect You to Die is that, um, you know, Shell may have a very sort of inclusive, broad idea of what games are, but that doesn't necessarily, like, you know, he's a designer, right, of, and an engineer. He's going to make things with a lot of, you know, interlocking systems and, and all that. He's just personally, I think, uh, giving a very generous definition, uh, which is kind of nice, I think. Okay, so he talks about introspection, okay, being able to use our own internal ideas uh, and thoughts to guide game design, and, and, and he kind of contrasts that with, with trying to use external evidence, right, and the kind of pros and cons of this. And uh, this is another thing I think is a really cool part of the book because it does kind of illustrate how uncomfortably in between an art and science, once again, game design really is because, as he points out, okay – can a game designer use their own uh, kind of personal likes and dislikes, their own taste to, you know, 100% guide their game design philosophy? Well, maybe yes and no, right? Uh, it depends. Um, now, uh, of course, we know logically that uh, just because you feel something is true doesn't mean it's actually true. That's just your feeling on the matter. Um, so that would sort of imply that, well, we can't design games unless we were, we're going out and having all the focus groups and getting all the data and we can't make any decisions unless we do that. Um, however, you know, he points out that you can't, that you don't really, you can't really progress that way either. Right. Um, so we're not scientists. We don't have to empirically access things that way. So we have to find kind of a middle ground here, uh, kind of educated introspection is kind of what I would say. Um, so uh, one of the dangers of entirely crafting things based only on your tastes and preferences, it's definitely a way to go, right? It's definitely a path you can choose, and it's a legitimate path, especially uh, for the games as art crowd, right? It's yeah, completely valid. Uh, is, again, more from a um, commercial perspective, I think one error that you can make uh, is you then make things based on your own tastes, but what if your tastes are odd or niche, right? And, you know, I give a personal anecdote here. Actually, that album there, that's uh, the Jack DeJanet Complex uh, jazz album from the early 70s. Um, so one Christmas, I thought it would be great if I gave to all of my family various jazz albums, because I, I love jazz, right? Uh, and like, uh, so I'm giving them these gifts based on my own internal preferences. They, I'm pretty sure none of those albums got listened to. Maybe my dad listened to Blue Train a little bit, because at least that's more accessible. I don't think my brother-in-law uh, ever listened to Birds of Fire uh, by the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Are these names ringing a bell to anyone? Anyone actually recognize these things? Uh, I didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're great albums, actually. Uh, so that's an example of me relying on, like, my internal tastes, but, like, my internal tastes aren't like many people, right, in, in this area, okay? So that's why sometimes it's good to have external input um, because sometimes our internal compass needs sort of calibrated, especially when we're thinking about 
uh, commercial things. Uh, now, the, on the flip side, if we only rely on external data, uh, there might be really cool, different, unusual ideas that never happen, right? Uh, because sometimes an unusual idea needs some development, needs some iteration, like it's not fun right away. Uh, and an example I would say, um, actually, let me make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes uh, an idea doesn't land doesn't mean it's a bad idea so if you're always going on this external data you can miss opportunities uh one anecdote i kind of have about this is on earth defense force insect armageddon i remember and this is by no means that unusual of an idea it's actually a pretty normal idea but i still think it illustrates this point uh is i prototyped uh these missions where you were uh you know inside the little edf helicopter plane harrier thing the EDF lander, I think, and you were just shooting on the turret, right? You were flying with the lander, shooting down with the turret. So like I said, not exactly a revolutionary idea in any sense, but it was something that we weren't doing the game at all, right? Um, and because I'm not an animator or I'm not like a hardcore software engineer, I was just using the scripting and coding and art tools I had to hack this together. So it was like basically a lampshade model like it looks that's what it looked like in a way this lampshade looking thing that i just crudely attached the player character to just you know imagine you know a shooter and, and you just like just stick the character on something and then have that thing fly very stiffly around like just in straight lines um very primitive uh and i remember that being demoed to everyone at the company and of course because of the crude nature of this demo most everyone there thought it sucked, right? Thought this was stupid. Um, and, and that's that external input then, right? Uh, this is this is a terrible idea. It looks bad. It's silly. Fortunately, right, The uh, and this is always a nice thing when it happens, uh, the CEO thought it was a good idea, thank goodness. Um, and, you know, because he had the ability to squint at it and see that, hey, if we got Rob some help, if we got him an animator that can make a cool, you know, animation of the ship banking in dramatic ways, and we we make a cool, like, uh, you know, EDF lander model that looks great, and we, you know what I mean? If, if we actually, you know, polish this, this would be a kind of a cool, exciting thing. Um, and so, you know, that's at least uh, an example from my career of maybe an idea that wasn't necessarily unusual, but external data was going to maybe squash it, but someone's gut instinct overrode that, right? Uh, and curiously, in games history, we even saw that a little bit with the release of the Nintendo itself. Uh, if you remember, uh, Minoru Arakawa was like, this is never going to work here. And the CEO of Nintendo, uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi, was like, yes, it will, because I said so. And it did anyway, right? So, it's, you know, again, you have to balance, right? Introspection can be wrong. External data, not always definitive either. Okay, so uh, the first lens he introduces is emotion, okay? So um, being able to use introspection, despite its epistemological problems, epistemology, the study of knowledge, is important. Uh, so being able to use introspection for Shell is important, and that leads to the first lens he talks about, the lens of emotion, which is just analyzing how different games make you feel, okay? And conversely, trying to then, as a designer, elicit the desired feelings from the player, okay? So that's the first lens he introduced, the lens of emotion. And, you know, I include Resident Evil 7 because, you know, what games evoke more primal emotions than any survival horror, right? Like the fear that it's trying to get out of you is, you know, that's definitely a genre where provoking a strong player emotion is, is quite important. Okay, so this is just a graph or, or a chart of various emotions, right? So there's lots of these, right? Um, and we won't necessarily um, open this up for discussion right now because we've got a few other discussion things in this lecture. But uh, just think about, in the back of your mind, uh, all of these different emotions, have, has a game made you feel these, right? And now some of the more primal ones uh, might, you know, rage. For sure, yeah. I mean, you know, I've raged at a game. Who hasn't done that, right? Uh, but is there a game – actually, I will open this up for some discussion. Game ever made you feel vigilance? <laughs> right? uh, these could be tricky things. Think about. Um, like vigilance. That's a strange uh, a feeling to – 
uh, sort of think about in terms of a game, right? Um, what about, let me look at some of the more pensiveness. Has a game made you feel pensive, right? So uh, it's kind of amusing to think about that. Uh, you know, uh, so yes, definitely fear, maybe some terror. Admiration. This game made you feel admiration, right? That one I think I, I, I can say yes to. I think when you play a game where, um, uh, you know, when, when you play a game that, like, has something, uh, you know, some really cool representation of something in it and, and you're just sort of admiring the, the craft, right? I mean, it could be that, could be other things. Um, disgust. Anger. Content, anger for sure. That's rage game. Contempt. Uh, so lots of things, lots of things that probably aren't typically uh, utilized you can think about, right, in your game designs. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a couple of big, big feel moments I've had in games, all right? And then I'm going to ask you for some of yours, all right? So as I go through my examples, think about times where games made you feel the feelings, Okay. So I'll start with ActRaiser because it's like maybe the earliest I can think of in my life where a game made me, you know, really feel something. Okay, now, uh, who's familiar with ActRaiser here? Um, uh, so, okay, it, it's good. Uh, I'm ha and actually, it, it just got remastered on the Switch. There's a new remastered version uh, out now, so that's kind of cool. So it's actually a now a contemporary game again. That's neat. Uh, but it was a uh, Super Nintendo game, um, sort of, I don't know if it, it was a launch game exactly, but it was pretty early on. Um, and the, the thing about ActRaiser that makes it really cool is, uh, at least, it's kind of funny, in the in the American version, you're like an angel, because Nintendo of America is weird about religion stuff, And but in Japan, you're just, you're actually God, okay? Like, they, they you know, they just changed that localization and the boss, the final boss, in the American version is called Tanzra, just sort of a demon thing. And in Japan, it's actually Satan, okay? So in ActRaiser, you are God, and you are trying to guide the world, all right? Uh, and the game is split into two different halves. There's the uh, sort of, you are going to incarnate yourself into a mighty warrior and fight for your people. Uh, that's the side-scrolling action stuff. And then there's another half where it's like a simulation, where... You are God looking down on your people. They're building their houses. You're like directing weather and things to help them. And also kind of amusingly, if they, if their like houses are old, if it's thatched huts and you earn points based on uh, population growth. And so if you notice some thatched huts growing next to more advanced uh, housing, you can actually send lightning and destroy them and actually kill people in there, which is not necessarily <laughs> nice at all, um, but that's a thing. Yeah, uh, it's something that you can do and actually is, the unfortunately, the way that to actually maximize your town's population. Uh, but that's there's a simulation portion of the game. So it's an interesting game just from a design perspective because you have this sim in this action game it, you know, combined into one experience. But the emotional thing uh, was this. So um, there's this really cool narrative moment um, where I'm going to try – to not spoil in too much, this isn't even that deep in the game, fortunately, where it describes uh, basically the invention of music in, in the world, right? Um, and kind of how that happened. And how that comes about is actually a really powerful narrative moment, right? Uh, it has something to do with, again, not to spoil it, it has something to do with, uh, you know, the, the battles that you have to fight, you go down, you know, you go down, you incarnate yourself into a warrior, you help your people out, basically, you come back up, um, and things happen, and as a result, music is, like, invented, right, and it's kind of neat, and as a musician myself, of course, I guess that will hit me square in the feels, uh, but it's not just the narrative, right, it's the narrative combined of how it ties into the actual gameplay and how it works, I think is what makes it powerful. Now, my MGS5 example... Um, there's actually multiple things I could pull from that game. Uh, I'll probably get more hands on this one. Phantom Pain players, MGS5 Phantom Pain, so good, so good. Really, really freaking good game. Uh, so anyway, um, so now it, you should all go play this, right? It, it hasn't aged a day, for one thing. Anyway, uh, yeah, there's so many different moments I could use for this, but the one that I'll actually talk about is uh, they do such a good job, um, kind of, I hate this term because uh, it sounds so stuck up, but I'm going to use it anyway, ludonarratively. 
they do such a good job uh, of kind of grounding into you that you're, you know, you have to be this hardcore mercenary and like, like, you know, uh, you have to actually do like rotten things to achieve the end goal. And that's kind of just the world has put you in that position. You know, you're a diamond dog, right? That's what they even call you. We take the bad jobs no one else will take. And so there's this mission in the middle of the game. And again, I'm not going to spoil things. Uh, so I'll try to talk vaguely where uh, you are put in a position to do uh, a horrendous thing, right? Just horrible thing, like, and you think you're going to do that thing, right? Because actually control is taken away from you. This is like in a cutscene. Uh, this is maybe an instance where taking control away from the player is a, a good thing because it really creates this suspense, right? Like, no, no, the guy, the the, the sort of anti-hero character you've been playing as is going to finally do like something that you just cannot uh, defend at all, right? But then he makes another choice, and it shocks you. And it actually, like, when I was playing the game, I actually shouted at the TV, like, when this happened. I was like, yes, yes, that's my boss, right? That's the character's name's boss. So that was a great emotional moment that I had. Now, I've shared a couple. I want to hear your big feels, your gaming big feels. Yes, go. Oh, the ending, the way it ended? Yeah, yeah no, that that's an affected game ending, and we definitely won't spoil that. Uh, uh, yes, and we'll go to you next. Uh, Pokemon Retreat Dungeon Explorers of Skies and Explorers of Skies ended. I played it when I was like nine, but my god, that ending was really mean. It's mean. Interesting. So you wouldn't, you know, it's funny because when you say uh, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, I don't immediately think big, big feel emo content, right? But I guess yeah, that. It's, <laughs> like it, for, it's like for a Pokemon game, it's really story driven. And the. The music combined with like the moment that happens at the end it just hits you in the feels. Like it hurts a bit. Okay, your big feel moment. So, um, getting over it with Bennett body. Um, Interesting. I could see that though. I have never rage quit at a game so hard. Um, I was, I was so angry. I was. Um, of the game, I was up where I was starting to get into the snow, and I fell and just bounced off and ricocheted off the things, and ended up back at the starting point. <laughs> oh um, no! But that took 32 hours of gameplay to get to that point, and then I was back at the point I was. Ah, uh, right. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to ping around the room as best I can. Uh, yes, go. All right, I'll hit one more from over here, and I'll go back to the middle. Okay, your your big feel. Okay. Oh, is this the Russian thing? No Russian? No. Ah, okay, okay. All right, all right. All right, your big feel. Slowly get shot, watch slowly die, and they oh, like, yeah. feeling of, oh my god, I've just lost the only family I've ever had, and he just goes on this rampage to find out that he was actually alive. That's what I'm thinking. And uh, I have never cried so uh, hard in my life. Uh, 
Okay. All right, your big feel. And and those are the Telltale games, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're very effective. I think you had your hand up, that, and you may have put it down. Did you have your hand up? Um, so if you like, you can give us your big feel. That's really fascinating. You know, uh, one quick anecdote. Uh, there were some research students here that did a VR project where I think like a puppy died or something. And it was just like, it, yeah, and it was intentional. It was, it, yeah, it was intentionally designed to, yeah, kick you right in the feels massively hard. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> all right um boy i would i could easily go the rest of the class hearing about these um but i think i, I should probably proceed through uh the rest of the lecture so sorry for those i, I didn't call uh, but we can just go on and on this is fun right and this is why um this is probably an assignment idea, not for you. You have enough assignments, but for a future iteration of the class. Um, so I think what this really shows us is, uh, you know, there, I don't hear this as much lately, fortunately. So maybe we're, we've stopped this sort of discourse. But a lot of people will say, you know, story in games is bad. Like, you know, go, go watch a movie, read a book. And, you know, uh, when, when I have this discussion, it just shows that, no, actually – uh, the story and narrative in games is actually deeply impactful to people. And how can it not be? I mean, you're spending in some cases like a hundred hours in, in this and like, uh, and, and you're spending that much time with a character. So you're really primed, I think, for strong emotional reactions. And it's a great lens to build things around. Really is. Okay. So this brings us to, um, and, and by the way, uh, let me just make sure, uh, you know, I put up the statewide so you can see it, right? Majora's mask, uh, life is strange. Um, so anyway, uh, this brings us to Jesse Shell's surprisingly simple definition of fun, right? Fun is, you know, there, there's an entire branch of research trying to define what it is. And he comes up with this very eloquent, simple definition, pleasure with surprise, now, you know, I think we can probably pick that apart and, and, and say it's maybe a little more complicated than that. But I do think it's a good – if you're going to bake it down into something that small, I think it's pretty good actually. Uh, and by the way, why do I have this particular sandwich on the screen? I actually – it's to contradict Shell a little bit because he talks about how eating a sandwich is pleasurable but it cannot be surprising. I disagree. Have you ever had a sandwich that was – really good in a way that you uh, didn't expect. And the reason why I chose this, this is a, a French bread sandwich with uh, hamburger buns in it, right? And so I was vacationing in Paris uh, with, with my family in 2000, um, when was this? Uh, 16, wow, that long ago now. Um, and we just, you know, we got this sandwich at this little deli in Paris and that's what it was. It was uh, you know, French bread, which of course you'd expect, I guess, uh, and some kind of vegetable condiment combo and like hamburger, uh, you know, hamburger patties inside. And I never would have thought to put hamburger patties in a sandwich. And it was incredible and it was surprising. So I would push back. I think food can be awfully surprising uh, in, in good and bad ways. Um, so uh, nonetheless, though, it is an interesting uh, stab at defining fun. Uh, Shell says we are hardwired to find surprises pleasurable. And yes, if you have a, um, you know, if you have a seven-year-old daughter, you've bought a lot of these overpriced LOL surprise eggs, uh, as I have, uh, and, and they're all predicated on, you know, surprise, right? The fun of not knowing what's in there, right? Um, surely, of course, that this cannot be the entire 
you know, definition of fun. And I think we understand that. But it's a very effective tool, right? Because when you think about moments in games uh, where, you know, you were having, you know, a good time, but then something happened you didn't expect, and often that's the thing that pushes it to uh, the next level. So, uh, for instance, for me, actually yesterday night, so we have five minutes left, but we're almost, almost done here. Yesterday night... I had a particularly difficult, yes, Death Stranding delivery. Uh, it was a premium delivery, which means there's like harder rules. It was like all the way from uh, wherever the incinerator is, that way station, all the way to the geologist. If you played the game, you know what I'm talking about. My zipline network, not well developed in that area. Um, and so by the time I get there, my stamina, there's like a stamina bar you have. It was utterly depleted and once it gets depleted you fall down more you stop and huff and puff the game becomes like unbearable to play basically because you you know you have no stamina um and here's the surprise part that game has this asynchronous multiplayer thing where like uh, other players just put crap in their world and then it shows up in yours okay uh so you're always seeing like random junk from other people and the thing I hate the most are the stupid signs. They're just like little holographic signs. And I always like, you, you know, take them out of my world when I see them because it's this beautiful Icelandic photogrammetry based environment. And I just hate the freaking signs. But I'm just trying to like win this delivery, right? And I'm trudging along, no stamina. And I hit the little uh, keep on keeping on sign. And that gives you a little stamina boost. And I didn't realize that's what it did, actually. And so now I was able to complete the dang delivery because I ran into one of the signs that I actually usually hate and get rid of as soon as I see it. So that was a surprise, right? That was like, that made me a little bit more engaged. I was so delighted by that. Uh, okay. Um, just a little bit more to talk about. Yeah, and so some Phoenix Wright uh, players in here I see. Uh, the lens problem solving uh, games uh, have problem solving. You know, games have problem solving inherently a part of games, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with my research earlier, which is you know when you make something that is functional, people like it. And one of the things that commonly gets made in these student projects are puzzles, uh, things to solve. And so when you present a player with a problem, here's the key though, and they're able to solve it, they usually have fun. That's what I'm even seeing in my research right now. Um, so, to use this lens, you ask yourself, what problems are you presenting? Um, are there hidden problems, or are they, you know, obvious? In other words, are there some layers of thinking you have to engage in to, like, figure out how to solve something? And what new problems can you use uh, to kind of help players enjoy your game, be more engaged? Uh, and the example I have here comes from Trails of Cold Steel. Any any Falcom fans in the group? Uh, we're, we're digging deep into niche JRPG territory with these. Uh, they're very freaking good games, uh, by the way, if you've never played any of them. And it looks like none of you have, which I'm not surprised. Um, so, yeah, uh, Trails of Cold Steel, Falcom, uh, on uh, the PS4 remaster is much better, uh, so I would recommend that. Basically, you're presented with this scenario where it is... Um, it's like turn-based combat, but you can move the characters around, and, and that matters where they're positioned. So in this scenario, you have these two bosses. You've only fought one at a time up to this point. And so what happens is you get here of your party, and you have now you know a scenario where you have to fight basically double uh, the amount of bosses uh, with this particular character. And you'll just get party wiped like instantly, like the first time you come up here. So that's like a problem, right? How do you solve that problem? And the way you end up solving the problem is you have to use the systems in a little bit deeper way. Like there's a, like any JRPG, they introduce tons and tons of stuff. We know this about the genre. Um, but what this game, I think, does a particularly good job at is putting you in scenarios where the only way you get past it is if you use these deeper systems properly. So you just go in there, you hit the attack button, maybe use basic magic, uh, whatever magic is called in this game, which I forget now. Uh, you're just going to get wiped, right? But uh, upon repeated attempts at this, uh, and they're smart, they just let you restart right from there, so it's not too punishing. You eventually learn, oh, I got to use some of the deeper game systems. I have to do things like even pay attention to turn order and try to manipulate that. There are spells that you can cast. 
they don't call them spells in the game, but I'm calling it that, that like slow down enemies so they fall in the turn order that you see start. In other words, you have to get creative with the systems. You have to think about how you're using them. So those are the types of problems that you can present players to solve. And if they solve it, you feel really good about it, right? Or as my data is showing, if they can't solve it, they think your game's the worst, okay? So that's kind of the danger of this lens. Um, okay, so uh, last thing, and because we're right at the time, and yes, attendance word, attendance word is giant enemy crab. Giant enemy crab, okay? I'll just accept crab, giant enemy crab, all right? That's today's attendance word, the assignment is up. Already, so uh, shells full definition of a game. Uh, fun is pleasure with surprise. Play is a manipulation that satisfies curiosity. A toy is an object you play with. A good toy is an object that is fun to play with. A game is a, sol a problem-solving activity approached in a playful attitude. And uh, the Windows bar is covering this. Uh, that last thing is clearly games have some range, which is why I have The Last of Us and Littlest Pet Shop. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks, that's it. Thank you. And I'm so angry. <laughs>